gets really excited for Christmas? Anybody real excited? I love the Christmas season. This is the one time of year that I love to sing Christmas carols. This is the time of year that I get real festive, that I like to spend some a little bit more money on my wife for presents than her typical life. So it is my year to go crazy. We've got some cool presents planned for Lila. You know, but one of my favorite things about this time of year is just that, as a pastor anyway, but even as a Christian, we have the opportunity to, to share the message of Jesus with the world that's kind of wanting to hear something. I was talking to my brother yesterday, and we know we live in a secular society. We know we live in a day and age where there's a lot of people that are resistant to the gospel. But you know what? I think that the majority of people, uh, one, are curious and want to know something about church. They're curious and they want to know something about, about God. And, and it's our responsibility, I believe, especially this time of year, to be a messenger. Have you ever thought of yourself as a messenger? I've got a messenger bag. Julie calls it my purse, you know, my man purse. And, and I've got a lot of things that I carry in it. And so if you ever look through people throughout the city, people are on bicycles. And, 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 and messaging is like, you know, they hand something, they take somebody, they get on their bike, they make it through traffic, and they take the message to another part of the city. If you look on our iPhones or smartphones, and if you look on our computers, everything's all about instant messaging and, and Kink Messenger and Facebook Messenger and Yahoo Messenger. Years ago, it used to be AOL Messenger. We love to share information with people. We love to share news with people. For something fascinating, I don't know why I'm so addicted to Facebook. I just like to read what's going on in people's lives, but there's something about people that were curious to carry something and share information and share news with other people. Um, but I don't want us to just think that our lives are filled with just carrying like information and messages that don't really mean anything. I think we have a responsibility to, to make sure that we're carrying out a message every day. Do you realize that? That our lives carry a message. Whatever it might be, your life, when you wake up tomorrow morning, you get ready for work, you're going to be carrying a message with you. And whether that message to the people around you, your sphere of influence is that you're more concerned about your own goals and your own life and the people that, that, that you have to deal with, your own plans, or the message that you carry. As somebody who calls themselves a Christian might be like, hey, I'm, I carry a message that I'm concerned about what other people are going through. I'm concerned about this, the, the life that, that I'm living. I, I carry a message by the actions that I live. All of us carry a message. So this Christmas season, we're going to be surrounded by people. Whether it's a small sphere of influence or it's a very large sphere of influence. And I believe this, that if you have a relationship with Jesus, then he has selected you to be a messenger of the Most High God. You know, if you one day in your life decided that you were going to put your faith in Jesus, and many, many of you in this room know what I'm talking about, that day that this relationship began, he put a message inside of your heart, and you have a responsibility to share this message with as many people as we can. And I think this is why it's so important that we read our Bible, because we need to be sure that the message that we're sharing, the way that we live our lives, is reflected um, exactly what the Bible is. Because I think there's a lot of people who, who get the message a little screwed up a little bit. See, a, a messenger is somebody who's sent. A messenger is somebody who's been commissioned to go and share this good news. And this is what God's done for us when we have Jesus. He says, listen, I want you to go and I want you to take this message to as many people as possible. And so I'm going to share this story with you. It's found in Luke chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, if not, you can follow along on the screen. It's Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. And we're going to be listening as Gabriel approaches Mary. Because Gabriel is this messenger of God who approaches Mary, this 12-year-old girl. And this is the message that he shares with her. And again, I want you to consider yourself somebody like, like a Gabriel. You know, as a messenger. And imagine Gabriel. He has the responsibility. God must have called him into his quarters. I don't know how God and angels communicate. Something. Maybe they just thought it to each other. But somehow God says, Gabriel, now is the time. And he says, I want you to go to earth. And I want you to find Mary. And when you find this young girl, I want you to tell her that she's going to be caring. The, the savior of the world. So imagine he must be excited, maybe a little nervous. And if you're going to carry a message, I'm sure he wanted to do everything, 
not to screw it up. Have you ever played telephone? You know, where one person, if I were to share Ian a message and I said, buy Pastor Dave an iPad. By the time it got down to Natasha, it would be like, Pastor Dave's going to buy everybody an iPad. See, the message along the line gets screwed up sometimes. So I'm sure Gabriel, with this responsibility to tell Mary that she's going to be carrying the baby, he probably said, he probably kind of said, oh God, please give me strength. I don't want to screw this message up. And, and let's read about this encounter. Found in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. This is what it says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent, again, here's a messenger that sent, the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a, a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could be. And this is what he says. And I love this. This is what I'm going to focus on today. He says, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Mary, the angel, told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, well, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Once more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived the son and is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So Mary at this stage, a lot of commentaries uh, say she could have been as young as 12 years old. So she's engaged, and, and when you're engaged to somebody in, in, in this culture, he could have been much older, or, 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 or it, once you were engaged, it was almost like you were married. And so she was kind of holding herself for that one special night that they were going to consummate the marriage, and an engagement could have lasted as long as a year. So here she is, 12 or 13, maybe a little bit older, but as young as that age, and, and she's maybe in the garden. You know, think about women in the room. What were you doing when you were 12 and 13 years old? I remember when I was doing 12 and 13. 12 and 13 years old, you're living life. Maybe you like this guy, Joseph. You're not really sure. So there you are. Maybe you're folding clothes or you're doing the dishes. Something's going on. And boom, out of nowhere, there's this big angel. Maybe he's 9 feet tall, maybe he's 15 feet tall, and his wings behind him are kind of like Maleficent, if you've seen the movie. These <laughs> massive angel wings. I don't know what he looked like. And all of a sudden, she turns around, and there's this angel behind her. See, that would have been enough to kind of scare her. I'm like, oh my gosh, my life's over, you know? And so, he says, listen, you have a favor with God. She's probably confused because she knows herself, and she's, I'm only 12. I just screamed at my mom this morning, you know, I'm selfish. How can I have found favor with God? What have I done? And then she doesn't know what's happening here. And before he goes on any further, this is what he says to her in verse 30. He says, do not be afraid. You know, I love that about God. Because when he's going to share something with us, before I believe he, he gives us these words and he challenges us about something that's going to happen. He always encourages us, I believe. He always says, listen, before I lay a smackdown down on you, before I tell you what you're going to happen, what's going to happen, before I lay it all out, he says, I want to encourage you first. Don't be afraid about what I'm about to tell you. He says, do not be afraid. And he goes on and he says, you're going to have a baby. And this baby is not going to be like any ordinary baby. This baby is going to be the Savior of the world. Twelve years old, told her, you're going to get pregnant with the Savior of the world. And she's like, I don't know what's going to happen. And, and he says, don't worry, everything's going to be taken care of. And the rest of the story goes on. We're going to look at some, some more of it next week. You know, Mary at this stage in her life, she could have kind of went crazy and said, this is not going to happen. I'm not going to let this happen. I don't deserve this. But something inside of her, I've always pictured Mary as, 
as kind of receiving the news and about being pretty calm about it. You know, she didn't panic, but she kind of held on to her, 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 she held her composure. And, and why is that? I believe it was because of the messenger, Gabriel. There was something about the messenger that was sent from God Almighty into her presence. And even though he had some of the most shocking news anybody could ever hear, Mary didn't freak out, and she didn't lose it. But she held it together, and I believe those few words that says, do not be afraid, helped her through this momentous time of life. You know, I was looking that up, do not be afraid, or do not fear, fear not. And I found in the Bible, it's about 110 times, God says to people throughout the Bible, He says, fear not. He says, don't be afraid. And, and I look at that, and I was like, wow, this, this is the kind of message I believe that God wants us to share with the world. As messengers, we're responsible to carry this good news to people. But I think a lot of the world it, it is afraid. I think when it comes to church, when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to getting involved in, in, in some kind of religious organization, I think people are afraid. But if we're these messengers called by God, then again, we have this responsibility to approach people and help them to understand that they shouldn't be afraid about what God wants to do in their lives. So a few things I want to share with you tonight. When it comes to helping our friends and our family members this season, as we bring this message to them, how do we show, what do we tell them not to be afraid of? I think the first thing is I want to share with you is three C's. I think we should say to them, don't be afraid of commands. Don't be afraid of commands. Well, what do I mean by that? See, growing up in church, for me, it was all about rules. I was taught as a 12-year-old, as young as 12, even younger as I can remember. My mom used to just tell me about everything that a Christian should do. That's what my mom, that was what my relationship with my mom was like growing up. And, and why? Because she wanted me to, to love God and to do my very best and follow God. So this is what she would say to me. You can't go to the movies. I was never allowed to the movies. Mom, I want to dye my hair. You can't dye your hair because the devil dyes his hair. Mom, I want to pierce my hair. You can't pierce your hair because the devil pierces his ears. You can't get a tattoo because if you put a tattoo on your body, the devil would. So it was like all this crazy stuff. And, and, and some people don't think it's crazy. I understand that. But everything that I wanted to do, it seemed like it was all about what we're looking for is people to kind of like give up everything that they've ever done and change the way that they live their lives before they even put their faith in Christ. And it just doesn't make sense to a lot of people. But I think we have to understand that we need to get them to a place that they belong, then they believe, and then eventually through the journey of life, they will begin to behave in the manner that Jesus wants them to behave. But sometimes we get a little bit backwards. But when we share this message, we should share with them, listen, when you read the Bible, though the Bible's full of all the rules and all the do's and all the don'ts, you know what the Bible says so much more about? It talks about the faith through grace that we have in Jesus Christ. It talks about how we're saved, not by our works and not by the things that we do. In Ephesians 2, it says this. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this because this is a gift from God. See, people are looking for this freedom. Could you imagine that? When they, somebody says, oh, I don't want to go to church because church is all about rules. And you say, listen, who's taught you that? Did you know that when you come into a relationship with Jesus, Jesus loves you not because of the things that you do and that you don't do. He doesn't love you because you're perfect. He doesn't love you because of any of these things. He loves you because he loves you. And what happens is when you begin to help people understand that the grace of God is so big, is so large, we can't even comprehend it. You know what happens throughout their life and their journey? They want to do everything to live in obedience to God. See, I lived in guilt my entire life up until about five, six years ago. It was all about what I was screwing up. I didn't pray enough today. I didn't read my Bible enough today. I carried this weight and this guilt, and I wasn't living in the freedom that God wanted me to live. And people began to just share with me, you read the Bible, and I still want to do the best. I know when I screw up, I just want to go to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. But the gospel, this good news as a messenger, should it lead off with the things that we do and don't do? But it should lead off that you can't do enough to be right before Jesus, but he loves you because of his undeserved favor, and that is called grace. Rules are here to help. Rules are here to guide. 
but lead them to an eternity with God and allow the Holy Spirit to bring the revelation that will show them how to live their lives. Let's be a messenger. Tell them not to be afraid of the rules, of the commandments. Number two, tell them not to be afraid of change. We need to show this world as messengers. Do not be afraid of change. For so many, who likes change? Anybody like change? One, one person. Maybe there's 30 people in the room. I like like little changes, you know, like it's like, oh, I'm gonna wear blue socks today. <laughs> you know, I like little changes. I, I don't like to be thrown into something. I, I'm just not a risk taker in some ways, or, or I am in some things, but no, I, I just don't like drastic change. I'm maybe a little bit more of a planner. And if God's gonna call me to live in another country, I wanna know what that's gonna look like a little bit. You know, it's not like we're just gonna get... so anyway, so but if you think about people, when we're sharing this good news of Jesus with them. What we're basically saying is like, Jesus is going to change your life. And if you think about that, in our friends, the people that you know, that's going to rock them. They're going to say, wait a second, Jesus is going to change my life? Well, what's he going to do? You know, because people don't understand the way if you've been brought up in church, what that even means. That, does that mean that Jesus is going to come into my room and, and begin to like, you, know, you say, like, he's going to work in your heart. What does that mean? Am I going to have open heart surgery? Like, we say a lot of things that people don't even understand. And when we talk about people are going to change, you know, like, again, a lot of times we say, we'll say the things that we should and shouldn't do. And it's like, oh, God will take you from your addictions. And that's great. And it does happen. And people start to understand. And they're like, I don't get what that means. But I want to take, like, the positive twist on change. Think about 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is what it says. It, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So when we tell people, listen, don't be afraid of change. You know, instead of focusing on the things that are going to happen, focus on what the Bible says, where he says, listen, new life is going to happen. I don't know what your old life was like, but when you have a relationship with Jesus, new life is going to happen. And what does that new life in Christ look like? I can tell you this, that my worst day as this new creation in the last 14 years is still a whole lot better than my best day when I was away from God. So when we become a new creation, what happens is we wake up with purpose in our lives. You know, when, when, when somebody says, well, I'm afraid to change, can you say to them, listen, are you afraid to wake up every morning knowing that there's a purpose on your life? Are you afraid to change and knowing that there's going to be a destiny on your life? Are you afraid of change and there's going to bring fulfillment? There's going to bring joy. There's going to bring peace. There's going to bring love. So when we talk about change, talk about the change that Jesus mentions throughout the Bible that encourages somebody. This is good news. This is the great news, and we are this messenger to help people not to be afraid of change. I get it. I understand how difficult this, this is for so many people, because for so many people, it feels like Jesus is going to come in and he's going to rock their world. He is. But when they understand that what they're giving up is nothing compared to this life that he gives us, who wouldn't want that kind of change? Listen, I don't know where you're at today in life, but I know for those of you in this room, many of you who've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you found this church and, and God has began to stir something up inside of you. Isn't this joy that you love to bring? Isn't this joy that you love to share with people? And this is the kind of change we want to focus on. Help people not to be afraid of change. If you think about Mary, why did he have to say, why did Gabriel have to say, do not be afraid? Because he knew that when he shared these words to Mary that she's going to, about to, she's going to be pregnant with God's Son from the Holy Spirit, that was going to change her world. It was going to change everything about her life. She was probably picking out her wedding to make out of <laughs> She was getting things ready. She knew the day was coming. The family was going to have this exchange of goods somehow. Everything was pretty planned. And all of a sudden, the angel says, do not be afraid. Let's help this world understand not to be afraid of change. The last thing I want to share is this. Help the people in this world 
Not to be afraid of church. Not to be afraid of church. I meet so many people, and I hear story after story, that people, they're not afraid of Jesus. They're not afraid of God. You know what they're afraid of? They're afraid of other Christians. They're afraid of the people that make up the church. For whatever reason, I don't know why, maybe people have had good intentions. Maybe you know people in your own personal life, people who call themselves Christians have burned you. And you think to yourself, I can understand why the world is afraid of church. See, we understand that the church isn't the community center that we meet in. It's not a building. The church is the people. But to the world, they don't understand that. They understand when I come to church, I'm going to go into a building, and I'm going to be around a certain type of people. But they're afraid of that. One time we were in this ministry in Glasgow, this woman, 35 years old, she comes through our doors, and she's shaking. And I said, how are you, how are you doing? It's the first time. And she's shaking. And I, and I said, hey, is everything okay? You know, should I call the ambulance? And this is what she says to me. She said, this is the first time I've ever been in church, and I'm afraid. 35 years old, never been to church before, but something inside of her, she was just scared. And now there's two things I think she could have been afraid of. Either the sin of her life is so big that somewhere along the line, she was just like, listen, if I go into this building, the, the, the walls are going to collapse all around me because she knew that there should have been this fear of God. Maybe that was it. Or maybe a well-meaning messenger along the way taught her that if your life's not perfect, that God doesn't love you. You know, how terrible is that? And then what we have to do then is people who love other people, we have to come in and repair these relationships that have been screwed up for year after year, decade after decade, relationship after relationship. We need to come in and say, listen, not every church is the same. And not every person is the same. But if you Give Jesus an opportunity to come into your life. He'll show you how much better life is with him than without him. You know, the church isn't a hospital for, uh, isn't it a, is, is a hospital for sinners. And it's not a museum for saints. You guys may have heard that many times. Do you realize that? So why when people come into these doors, sometimes they become so afraid of how people are going to look at them. You know, we, we, we make people come into the church doors and kind of feeling like, I'm not good enough. You know, I, I, my, my friend was telling me this story. There was two people in Bible college. And they were both students. They were dating. And you know what? They, 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 they slept with each other before they were married. And so they kind of kept it secret for a little while because they thought that as soon as they went into the church, because they'd seen this before, Boom, the pastor, the, the leader of the church is just going to just throw down the hammer and they're going to be expelled from everything. And this was what was happening. This was what was racing through their mind. And so finally they said, we've got to let this guy know what we did. So they meet in his office, scared, just shaking, just knowing how the church typically treats people who have sinned somewhere along in their life. That's what happens. I know it. I've done it. I've seen it happen to my family. Not anything bad, we just have good intentions, but sometimes our approach is just a little messed up. So he sits them down, and here they are, and they say, hey, what's going on? Is everything okay? And they said, Pastor, we just want to tell you, we screwed up big time. We slept with each other, and we're not married. I know it's a sin, and we're ready for whatever punishment. This guy went around the desk, and he said, you guys know you screwed up. And he came in and he put his arms around him and he just loved him. And he says, guys, let's walk through this journey. And let's make it, let's make things right, but let's see where God takes us. And these guys just continued on going to church and they, they, their life became restored. Because somebody took the time, somebody in the church took the time not to just point out, listen, just like Jesus, when, when everyone was ready to stone uh, this the woman who's caught in adultery, uh, who, who's never sinned before? You know what? But sometimes we hold people to a standard that we can't even hold ourselves to. And listen, I, I share these things because I this is what the people that I come in contact with, this is what they're afraid of. 
But this Christmas season, as these messengers of God Almighty, we have the opportunity to say, don't be afraid, church. Listen, maybe somebody hurt you along the way. But can I tell you about what the real church should look like? And, and, and as we love on people, and as we share this news with people, and as we walk them through life, and give them a chance to mess up. And you know what I love about God? There's so many things. But he's so patient with us. Think about your life. Oh, yeah. Are you patient? Are you, are you, aren't you glad that God's been patient with you? Listen, I, I'm getting to know a lot of you. But I've had you over my house. And some of you have probably done some pretty rotten things that I have yet to find out about. But what if the one day you come in and you say, listen, I just want to lay it all clean. And I say, I can't believe that you've done that. You are not allowed back in this church. What would you do? Not only would you get mad at Bridge Family Church, but you would get mad at God for a long time. And I meet a lot of people that are mad at God. Not because of, but because of what people have done throughout their life. Because we're, we get upset at church. And, and then there's people that, that want to come back to church. And they want to get their foot into the door. But they're just afraid of us. Maybe we've got horns coming out of our ears. And big fans. And they think we're ready to pounce on everything. But the truth is, I know many of you, we are just trying to love people? Isn't that what the church should be, you know, full of grace and love and mercy? The Bible talks about that. It says, listen, season every one of your words, your conversation with Saul. Let's continue to be this place that connects people to God. And, as, and this is a responsibility as, as Christians. As we introduce people to Jesus, we build relationships with them. Then we become somebody who helps them be disciples about Jesus. Because you don't let everything just go. And you don't just let every sin that somebody wants to commit just happen and you never say anything about it. But we take on the responsibility of walking through somebody step by step, loving on them every single step of the way, and trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to bring a revelation to their lives at the right time. God does it in His miraculous way. We don't have to play God so many times. But we need to be His messenger of this good news. Gabriel says to Mary, don't be afraid. And I'll share this as I think about the church. Because she was pregnant and she wasn't married, you know what the rules say, the commandments say? It said that she had that, that they had every right to take her outside of the city, city borders and stone her. And you know who was holding those stones? The church. It was all the people in the church that were ready to throw the first stone. It's crazy. But you know what the Bible that's why Gabriel says don't be afraid of, of, about, of what's about to happen. Because I'm going to take care of you. And this Christmas season, let's be a messenger of great news. Let's help people to understand. Let's not be afraid. Don't be afraid of commandments. Don't be afraid of change. Don't be afraid of the church. But come into a relationship with Jesus. And you'll see what he's going to do.